we as women were empowered to do our breast self-exam in the shower and go to our doctor and say, something doesn't seem right. I need to be screened. We were taught to do that. We need to teach us ourselves to do that with our brains. You know, you bring up such great points. Sorry, I get very excited. (laughs) Hi, and welcome to CNA Digital, the podcast. My name is Christina Reyes. I'm the SVP Creative Director with CNA Digital, and I'm thrilled to have a guest speaker with us today, Brooks Kenny, Consumer Activation Program Lead, Healthcare System Preparedness, with Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. Welcome, Brooks. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Christina. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Um, and I'd love to kind of start off just to give our audience a little bit of background on who you are, your experience. Sure, I'm happy to. Well, I've been a healthcare advocate my whole life. Um, I started in public health. And I've always been really intrigued by the intersection of public health education and marketing, thinking there's a lot we can do for social good with smart marketing tactics and storytelling. I've been in the Alzheimer's ecosystem for over a decade um, and you know, advocating for policy changes, advocating for system change, and really working to change the narrative when it comes to the general public and how we think about this disease. I'm really motivated by it because my story uh, with Alzheimer's is a personal one, like so many people um, in our country and the world, frankly, you know, who have experienced this disease with 6 million people uh, living with it, probably more than that in the United States. You know, it's, it's, you know, very common to have the experience, but yet everyone's experience is is very unique. Mine started with my mother-in-law who was diagnosed after a long, quiet, silent journey that she was having on her own. Uh, She was diagnosed far too late in her disease trajectory. I remember sitting in the family meeting room with a neurologist, a nurse, my husband and his siblings, he's one of five, um, and they handed us a piece of paper that had the A word on it, although they never said Alzheimer's disease. And I don't mean to be doom and gloom because we have made a lot of progress since then. That was about nine years ago now, but That story is a very common story. People getting diagnosed too late, providers not having the confidence or education, frankly, to talk about it with families. We walked out of that room. We didn't know what stage she was in. We didn't know the treatment pathway. We didn't know what our next steps were. And we were thrown into like a whirlwind of chaos. And that doesn't happen in cancer. You know, I often say, um, you know, my father was diagnosed with cancer colon cancer. And I said, what stage? And he said, good news, stage one. 10 years later, he's 88 years old today, actually, is his birthday. Oh, happy and, birthday to your father. <laughs> and, you know, he was treated and, and we all understood that trajectory. We all generally understood what it meant. And so I personally have never been more motivated than I am today in this field. Now that we have therapies coming to market, we have innovation in diagnostics. You know, I think there's a lot we can do to educate the general public and educate the healthcare community and change the healthcare system so that people don't have to suffer in silence and people can get the treatments much faster. So I'm super happy to be there. That was a long intro, but um, I am I am highly motivated to stay in front of this disease and and have it be something that is in the rearview mirror as soon as we can. Fully agree. And, you know, I think it's great. Thank you for sharing the story about your experience with Alzheimer's, like your connection there, because so many people really do have similar stories. Um, And I think, you know, you touched upon a a great point where oftentimes when you leave, unlike in a, a cancer situation, when you leave the doctor's office, there's questions about, like you said, the stage and what's our treatment path forward. And oftentimes it's a wait and see, or you can try stuff. But I think um, despite that, I think so many people from patients, caregivers, advocacy groups, the physicians themselves and and organizations like DAC, people really do want to help this, provide the most solutions possible, or at least share frameworks, share share ideas about what's worked for them. So absolutely. um, And it's, it's something, you know, in the mainstream media, it's really taken up, certainly with the past few years where you've had approvals and trials for drugs that appeared to be, um, putting us on the right path. 
let's say, towards figuring out some more solidified treatment. Um, in fact, I saw, so I, I watched, I subscribed to master classes and I tend to watch them every week. Did you see I do too. Okay. <laughs> they have we'll a have really to interesting notes one. because I, I subscribe too. I love it. Yeah, so many great topics like uh, across everything. So, um, but there was a really interesting one on brain health and talking about um, all the ways that you know brain health is just as important um, in terms of understanding like how it affects our body, how it affects our mood, our thinking. What are some tips and tricks that you can do um, to to kind of improve the longevity of your cognitive abilities? Um, right. And now I, I'd love to touch upon kind of DAC and talk about some of the work that, that they're doing that the organization is pioneering in this field. Absolutely. Well, you know, I live in Washington, so I live in a, um, a community of acronyms. So for your listeners, I'll, I'll just share. It's, it's a mouthful, but DAC stands for the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. And this is a global effort uniting leading organizations worldwide really with the vision of accelerating breakthroughs and innovation in diagnostics and treatment so that every healthcare system, and I really do mean, I mean, it's a big vision, every healthcare system can be equipped to end Alzheimer's disease everywhere. And it, you know, it's a bold move and it was launched at, you know, at the World Economic Forum right before the pandemic with the idea that it's gonna take a moonshot. It's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take a tremendous amount of funding to shift a healthcare system. Now, the place where I sit um, is called Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative System Preparedness. Now, that's a mouthful for, um, for those marketers listening. They might be going, why are you calling it that? But we really do need our system to be prepared. And so where I am is in this group of um, amazing innovators where our goal is to transform the healthcare system using implementation science to observe what is really happening in a healthcare system. It's not just so easy to say primary care needs to start dealing with Alzheimer's. Well, they don't have the systems in place to do that. So we use implementation science in order to observe what's happening in a system today and then apply real world changes to that system. The way that we often talk about it is these new diagnostics and new innovations. So what do I mean by that? New ways to screen and test for Alzheimer's so you can get to a diagnosis, new treatments that are available. Those innovations are analogous to a high-speed train. But the healthcare systems are working on wooden tracks, right? And those tracks are not connected to one another. So the minute for example, my mother-in-law was received that diagnosis. There was no roadmap. There was no action plan. You know, we often share that we created our family action plan and I send it out to friends and family all the time because wow. nobody knows the direction to go. Well, the same, you can say, oh, primary care, that's where people are going first when they're worried about their memory and thinking. But that primary care provider most likely has not been educated about which tools to use for cognitive assessment. They likely are not getting reimbursed for the test or know how to connect that reimbursement through the electronic medical record. One primary care provider recently at a conference told me, his colleagues said, we don't even have paper in our offices to actually do a, a handwritten clock test or you know another type of cognitive screen. So these are simple, but yet not observations that the work of DAC SP is trying to do to unlock what are these barriers? What is keeping a system from being able to provide that early detection in primary care? And it's a huge opportunity because we know that people are going to primary care before they ever, you know, before they get to a neurologist. We know there's a shortage of neurologists in the U.S. and certainly um, abroad. And so we have to address primary care as it relates to early detection, but it's not, it's not a, a simple solution. We've implemented some extraordinary um, projects in the U.S. and in many, many countries around early detection and have observed those in primary care. And we've actually created the early detection blueprint and are taking that blueprint and now digitizing it and bringing it to providers um, as often as we can so that they get that education. We have a lot of things to change on the policy side too, of course, but um, it's a multifaceted problem. And that's why 
the DAC SP program exists and it's really wonderful to be a part of it. I, you know, and I, I agree. I, I think um, I will say also we are just honored to be able to work with DAC and we've met different team leaders from around the world. And just I, I cannot stress enough, like the passion, the heart, the dedication they have to this, it, like whether they have a personal story or not. Um, but the work that they put into helping uh, bring together these global insights that we have, sharing it, but also really synthesizing that down, as you said, to be something that's um, able to be used in different healthcare systems by like different physicians. So like really taking something that's an incredibly complex subject, especially as it's touching multiple different health systems, kind of provider organizations, different cultures and communities around the world, and creating something that's actually actionable for them to use and, and convenient for them to use. Absolutely. Well, we're grateful to CNA for your work and and your collaborative, you know, partnership with us. And we, you know, we believe it's going to take everybody to working together, you know, staying in the lanes where they have the expertise and really building. I mean, when we did our grant program um, in, in different countries, you know, one example I'm reminded of was in Armenia, where it's a very difficult country to get around. And so they actually utilized a mobile service in order to take that to different communities to create opportunities for cognitive screening. That worked really well for them. Amazing. In Canada, where there are very few um, people that live anywhere near um, neurologists or primary care, they partnered with optometrists because they knew that, op that enough people lived near optometrists within the healthcare system they were working in order to get screening done through that provider. So these are innovative ideas that are being tried and tested quickly. I mean, and that's the optimum. It's, I was blown away by this statistic and I may not get it exactly right. I'm more on the marketing side than the memorizing of the stats, but it's something between 15 and 17 years after you have a clinical innovation that it actually gets to the bedside. Wow. I mean, that is absurd. Think of the families and the generations that would not get access to treatments that are available today because of the bottlenecks in the healthcare system. And so that's why I think, I love your comment, you know, everyone I've met that's been part of a grant or a flagship program, or that's working at DAC or we're collaborating, you know, with partners, everyone is as passionate as the next person. And I think it's because we're solving a real world problem. Uh, little by little, but never fast enough. <laughs> but we are, we all are in it. And, um, and it's exciting to see the innovation. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think like having that ability to try to get it to as many people as possible, because you bring up a great point with that stat, you know, it's staggering to think like we know things take time, especially certain innovations take time, but to get it just to like the public, just to bedside. And from there, like there's still challenges of access. There's still challenges of that knowledge transfer for it to really spread. So that takes time. So there's almost like these ripples of how long you're, um, how far you're able to have an impact and over what time. And it's a lot longer than we think. So I think especially having um, support from an organization like this that can provide the education that's able to tap into not just one segment of like people that are affected, but like the people that are supporting the people that the clinicians, the health systems um, really kind of strengthens that and really improves like the ability for us to effect a change. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it like any public health issue, I think there it's it's complex and we have to try to influence the system with policy change. We need champions inside the system that are willing to say we need to we need to modify how we're managing this right now. You know, we need providers to feel more confident in talking about this issue and we need easy ways to reach them. You know, we um, I recently at this uh, conference that we attended, the AAIC, which is the largest Alzheimer's mm -hmm. conference that happens each year. There was new data um, shared about providers and, you know, providers, this isn't, you know, maybe groundbreaking, but it, it was to the root, the group of us in the room, you know, there are innovations with blood tests, right? And they're most often called blood-based biomarkers. Well, what's a blood-based biomarker? It's just, a, it's a blood test. And there's, sure. there's a screening blood test and there's a confirmatory blood test. And, providers understand what a blood test is. So then how do we communicate 
which one to use, when to use it, what, what it means, how do we arm them with information? There was data shared at that conference for a, from AAFP and uh, GSA saying that providers in their membership groups primarily want to hear from their peers when it comes to education. They want to be able to do it virtually. They want to be able to do it in small sound bites. Um, you know, so they're telling us the way they need to receive information, right? And so when we think about it from a marketing perspective, that's a mutual exchange. We want to add value by bringing them education and support in a way that they want to receive it, not in a way that we put upon them, right? And so there's a there's a real opportunity to get our language in check and also provide education to providers, you know, through their channels that that are more desirable for them. And the same is true on the consumer side, you know, lots of work to be done there um, to empower people. And, you know, I think that's really important showing the collaboration aspect of it and like the hearing. This isn't just, you know, um, this isn't just saying like, we, this is what we've read is best or we've heard is best or we think is best. It's like what really works best for you because that's going to make it more effective if they're actually using it, if they're actually able to access these tools in a way that makes the most sense for them. Absolutely. Um, and you know, and I, I think there's really a benefit to that because I, right now there's such a, a groundswell in conversation, at least the past few years. I know I worked on a pharmaceutical product that was being explored for Alzheimer's disease. And there's a number that for the past few years have been like one approved, uh, more uh, another one approved following that. Um, and there's just, I think, you know, there's still so much work to do, but it's at least exciting. It's reassuring to see that like there's so much effort being put in from so many different angles that like being able to take advantage of that, to leverage that groundswell with patient patients, with caregivers, with patient advocacy groups, physicians, um, you know, it really helps. I think there's so much insight sharing, which is happening and that's really exciting. And like, I'd love to hear from your perspective because you have a unique one. Like what's something that you're excited about um, maybe right now, maybe what that you see upcoming in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I'm excited that we have treatments we can point to to help reinforce the value of early detection and diagnosis. So I'm all about the direct to consumer. That's like the world where I spend a lot of time and for many years, we've been saying when, you know, the therapies that are being researched, the therapies that are being hopefully coming to market soon are indicated for earlier stage disease. So we need to start talking not only about Alzheimer's, but we need to be talking about brain health. So that's been part of the narrative now in this community for quite a long time. What's interesting, many of us thought when these treatments were approved, every, you know, the, the system was going to be inundated with people demanding it. And that actually hasn't happened. I will say the system, I think, is inundated with people still wondering, you know, what do we do? What's the pathway that's happening? But we're not seeing consumers walking into provider offices and pounding their fist and saying, you know, I want this treatment. And so what I'm excited about is that we have had so much innovation in the diagnostic pathway. Um, most people may or may not know, I'm, you know, it, it wasn't common knowledge to me that 60% of cases go undiagnosed. Most cases that do get diagnosed, get diagnosed too late. You know, for years, it was not very often that you would talk to a person living with the disease in those earliest stages. Right. At this same conference that I was speaking of, I was watching a panel and a gentleman who's in a clinical trial with one of the new treatments, he did a fireside chat and he said out loud, you know, I'm thriving. I'm back to work. I'm living my best life. I mean, I'm quoting him loosely, but that actually, I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And I think it's because we need to get people who are experiencing this disease in front of the camera. We need to get people sharing their stories that you can you can have an early diagnosis of this disease and you can have a quality of life, you know, and it and that is really so exciting to me. So what does that mean from a you know consumer education marketing perspective? It it, it in my mind it means we have to rethink the way we talk about our brains, right? I mean, our brains are our most vital organ 
our brains control our, our thinking, our movement, our memories, our personalities. And yet it is the least talked about topic in our healthcare conversations, at the kitchen table, when we're out walking with our girlfriends or boyfriends, <laughs> you know, we're not talking about it. And, you know, we think that your brain health should be top of mind. We think we want people walking around talking about their brain health the way they might think about their heart health. We want people to know that 40% of Alzheimer's cases can actually be prevented if they adopt lifestyle factors. Right. We want people to feel comfortable going to their doctor and saying, I think I need a baseline. I'd like a cognitive screen. You know, just like when back in the 80s with breast cancer, you know, right. there was a member with the breast self-exam cards and that whole movement. And then, you know, women, obviously the policies became important to reinforce that, you know, the U.S. Preventive Task Force put forward recommendations for when women should get mammograms. But we as women were empowered to do our breast self-exam in the shower and go to our doctor and say, something doesn't seem right. I need to be screened. We were taught to do that. We need to teach us ourselves to do that with our brains. You know, you bring up such great points. Sorry, sometimes. I get very excited. <laughs> no, I, I love it because, you know, you, we think about like our brains sometimes, you know, it's not something that we see the way we might see another injury or we might feel a pain in our body and know that it's something we should get checked out. It's not like that with our brains. And, you know, when the symptoms may present, um, it's it, people may ignore it. People may not even realize it. But I think there's also something about a fear, a stigma, when they do start to realize even early on that there may be something deeper. And going back to the breast cancer analogy, like, you know, there was also some kind of stigmas around that. And like having this conversation about a, a sensitive topic for a lot of women with their doctors, how do we even approach it? So like having that ability to have education, to remove that stigma, where we're able to talk around, talk about this, like around the kitchen table with our friends, and it's not something scary, I think is really beneficial to like having that first step. And the way you said with breast cancer, like getting the screenings, having policies change, having physicians more aware so when patients came to them, they knew how to like appropriately manage these oftentimes sensitive topics. So I think that's that's a great analogy that you made and, and really like shows, underscores this need for these multiple avenues of being able to address this issue. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and you know, it's it's interesting when you look at the trajectory of, you know, public health causes, um, for lack of a better word, you know, I'm, I'm often reminded of the AIDS epidemic, you know, right. back in the 80s, people didn't want to talk about AIDS. Um, and there, you know, if you had AIDS, you died. Right, <laughs> right. And, you know, fast forward, and look at the ACT NOW movement and the advocacy around breaking through stigma. And now, you know, AIDS is considered a chronic disease. Yes. So there's a lot we can learn. There's a lot we can learn from cancer around what I was speaking of earlier, the staging of the disease, the, you know, there are patient navigators for people with a cancer diagnosis at, the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative, our system preparedness work, one of our new programs is, an, is a brain health navigator program to actually help navigate in the system so people understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. I often joke with, with my family that I've become a brain health navigator because if I post anything on Facebook or social media, you know, I have a lot of friends who reach out to me and I'm gladly She's there great. to help or say, oh, my neighbor or oh, my childhood friend you know, doesn't know what to do, mom is experiencing this, you know, and we should start to have a common nomenclature and a common pathway for families going through this so that we can get people the right support in the time frame that they need it with treatments as early as they can have them so that they're effective and so that their life has a higher quality and they're able to spend time with family and you know it's it doesn't have to be this dreaded uh sentence so to speak um so i'm really hopeful about the groundswell as you say that more and more people are paying attention i'm hopeful around the system change we're seeing at dac and the adoption of of many of the guidelines we have in our early detection blueprint and i just pray that the innovation continues and keeps coming. I think it's also really sparked 
um, it has sparked more excitement in the field, you know? I mean, sure. research hopefully will continue to increase and more and more companies will get in the game so that we can have a, a wealth of opportunities that could support patients that are dealing with this disease. Really well said. Um, you know, and I, and I know we're coming to the close of our segment, so I wanted to see if there was any last topics that you wanted to share. I think we covered so much and this has been fantastic, but I'd love to kind of turn the floor over to you to see um, what else may be on your mind. Well, you know, I appreciate you asking that and I, I want to be very, very candid. I'm not a provider, a medical provider, but I, I would offer to those watching and listening that there are things you can do, um, you know, to empower yourself around your brain health. The Lancet Commission has put out um, uh, wonderful articles and papers on this. You know, we know that lifestyle matters. We know getting exercise, getting good sleep, reducing hypertension, addressing hearing loss. There's a new study around addressing eyesight. We know that there are lifestyle things that we can do to better our brains and to keep our brains as healthy as we can for as long as we can. So I would encourage listeners to get informed about that. And my parting words would really be for people to start the conversation on this topic in wherever it makes sense to them. If you're listening and you work for a healthcare system, you know, we need you <laughs> to be a champion. If if you are in an advocacy organization, we we need collaboration and 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 advocacy support. If you are listening and and you're you know thinking about your your family, maybe gathering um, around the holidays that are you know in the fall and and winter, you know, start the conversation. There's so much that can be gained by just starting the conversation. And I know that sounds very simplistic, but you know, when I go to my doctor, I ask about my brain health every time and it, I'm nervous too, but I do it. Um, you know, I talk to my friends about it. I talk to my parents. So I would just encourage people to join us on this journey to normalize the conversation and to help, you know, create change across the system. Beautifully said, right? Let's have a conversation and let's make, let's affect some change with it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, this was incredibly insightful, just fantastic conversation. Really happy to have you had you on the podcast today. Um, and hopefully we'll have you again soon. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated the conversation too. I'm more motivated now than I was when we started. So thank <laughs> Likewise. you. <laughs> Likewise, I feel like I'm going to go talk to friends and family and just share some of the tips and comments around the conversation that we had today. So thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Take care.